All right, so this lecture, Gas Analyzers Part A, uh, ILM 310-304-CA, gets us going on the next uh, three ILMs in this set um, on gas analyzers. We start out talking about uh, general applications, some safety stuff. Um, then in this ILM, we delve into relative humidity and dew point analyzers. So that's kind of our jumping off point here for, for gas analyzers. So it says here, we've got some objectives, uh, applications of gas analyzers, safety concerns for gas analyzers, uh, principles of analysis. So how do they work and where do we use relative humidity? some calculations uh, for relative humidity using something called a psychometric chart which is lots of fun and can be confusing if you're doing it by yourself but uh, we should be able to make it relatively straightforward here today in this lecture and lastly principles of analysis and application of dew point analyzers so pretty uh, pretty elemental stuff here. So uh, characteristics of gas analyzer, safety issues, relative humidity and dew point. So let's see what we got here. Applications of gas analyzers here. So gas analyzers, as we know, are instruments that are designed to determine the chemical composition and or physical properties of gases for any number of different reasons. Uh, some applications that we're gonna discuss uh, includes safety applications, process control applications, pollution control applications, and quality assurance applications. So we have gas analyzers in this little uh, tree here, composition of the analyte uh, and different four different applications here, and then physical properties uh, largely related to uh, quality assurance. And we'll talk not so much about that really today but we will talk about that um, in some other ILMs here when we're talking about the physical properties like boiling point and vapor pressure and uh, things like that when we're into uh, refining and distillation uh, and that's where we largely focus on physical properties but most of the uh, content in this ILM is based around the composition uh, and these four particular applications that we see here. So we'll look at uh, some different types of gas analyzers. Um, some we are more familiar with than other probably. Uh, first of all, single gas analyzers uh, will analyze uh, specifically only one type of gas or they're designed to measure one type of gas, whether it's an oxygen analyzer or uh, H2S analyzer, for example, a combustible uh, analyzer possibly could be in there as well. Uh, but designed to, to measure one thing, uh, hopefully. Uh, number two here, multi-gas uh, multi analyzer here, uh, as the name would imply, has uh, separate sensors. So separate sensors for different gases all inside of one housing. A uh, common example of this would be a, a flue gas analyzer, which measures uh, the oxygen uh, and carbon dioxide in the flue gas. The last category of gas analyzer types and um, not something that we cover in third year material. This is fourth year material, but multi-component analyzers, uh, which analyze all the components in the sample. And this uh, kind of groups together things like chromatographs, mass spectrometers, uh, and, and things like that. So a handy little table uh, out of the ILM here to kind of put that in a nice easy study format for you. So those are the, the three types. For us, uh, we're focusing um, mostly on on the first two and not really at all on the third on the third one here okay so let's look at these applications uh, for gas analyzers here now categorically safety analyzers of course pretty straightforward we understand uh, safety analyzers are used obviously for safety and when we're talking about gases uh, we're talking particularly um, about hazardous air uh, so some examples of things that we look for would be low breathing oxygen levels so less than 19.5 percent is kind of the magic number when it comes to oxygen uh, once you get concentrations of oxygen lower than this uh, things start happening uh, physically to the human body and the human brain and goes relatively south relatively quickly as that number drops uh, number two here toxic gas content such as uh, h2s uh, carbon monoxide and, and other things here 
uh, we measure. So of course, uh, dangerous to, to human life and the environment, of course. And then number three, uh, combustible gas content. And we'll spend some time thinking about uh, thinking about this and talking about this when we get into the combustion uh, part of it here. But as a general rule, uh, combustible uh, combustible gases, of course, pose major issues. Um, most importantly, being explosions. So uh, all good uh, reasons for having safety analyzers. Second application is process analyzers. Um, and we can use analyzers, uh, gas analyzers, to control the process. Uh, we learned a little bit about um, this in the previous analyzer uh, ILM when we were talking about the speed uh, of the analyzers uh, and where they're mounted and, and uh, how they can uh, how they can be used. And when we're talking about process control, uh, the main thing here is that the reaction time of the analyzer uh, has to be faster than the process, meaning it has to be able to react to the changes quick enough to make a difference. Um, common application is burner control, where we're, we're measuring oxygen and carbon monoxide uh, in order to control uh, combustion parameters for uh, efficiency purposes and safety purposes. Other applications include uh, different mixtures created in a fractionation train, uh, so distillation processes, um, and using uh, analyzers um, can uh, help us maintain quality of product and processes like that. Fourth application here is pollution control. Um, of course, pollution control becoming more and more popular, uh, using these analyzers to ensure that the emissions are kept within government standards. Uh, is our primary concern. Uh, and then this uh, ILM, uh, our focus when it comes to pollution is largely related to combustion uh, again. Last but not least, quality assurance uh, applications uh, for gas analyzers. So uh, specifically when we're talking about things like natural gas and, and pipelines, we have to analyze them to make sure that the content is as desired or requested by the customer. Uh, contaminants in the in the gas, such as H2S, CO2, and nitrogen, of course, affect the product quality, especially uh, you know when we're expecting to buy uh, natural gas. We don't want any of these things here. Um, water, of course, can be problematic in pipelines in terms of corrosion and product quality. Again, uh, quality-wise, it affects concentration, right? If we're expecting to be measuring something that's supposed to be 100% gas and 10% and of it is water, well, then that remaining 90% that is gas is actually more concentrated uh, than is uh, truly being uh, represented. Um, and another specific uh, item here related to pipeline, uh, using density analyzers. Um, often pipelines are used to transport different products at different times, uh, and they can be differentiated um, by using density analyzers to distinguish uh, between those uh, product runs in a pipeline. So that takes us uh, through the first objective anyway, the kind of the introduction and some applications generally uh, for gas analyzers. Objective two, uh, describing safety concerns uh, related when working with gas analyzers. And uh, most of this uh, hopefully is common sense, but uh, the idea here with this lecture and this ILM is to make that sense uh, more common. So we'll look at some analyzer hazards. So two different types uh, of hazards that we're going to look at here. Maybe my heading on this page should be different. Um, but there are, are sample hazards, and there are also analyzer hazards. And the ILM is broken out to distinguish between the two of them. Um, so this first little section is really intended to be looking at sample hazards uh, specifically, which are by definition hazards due to the nature of the sample and our interaction with it. Uh, and this includes exposure, uh, exposure to combustibles, uh, toxic gases, heat, and pressures uh, related to the process that we're uh, sampling from. So as a general rule, uh, understanding the process and safe work planning will uh, generally mitigate most of these hazards. But again, under, understanding the process uh, is important. And if you don't know, uh, you know, ask, because um, there's nothing, nothing worse than an accident caused by uh, ignorance. Okay, hazard locations, uh, basically anywhere between the pipe tap and the analyzer, uh, there could be a hazard 
uh, at any point where you could break into that uh, into that system. So all of all of these uh, applications from uh, sample point through the transport system, the sample conditioning unit, the calibration facility, the waste, the analyzer and the house itself, and all the all the related parts there. Wherever there's a connection, you could uh, you could potentially be exposed uh, to these hazards. So it's remember uh, uh, it's important to understand uh, where and what you're dealing with and always to isolate, vent, and purge. And that's really the golden rule uh, as we move through this little objective here on uh, safety uh, and hazards. So again, isolate, vent, and purge, and make sure you understand the system and, and how to do that as you move through it. Okay, here we go. So again, I just kind of snipped this out of the ILM without intending to talk too much about it again, but just to reinforce the fact that there are many uh, circumstances when you may be exposed to danger. So make sure that you do understand the block and purge procedures. Um, most configurations are designed in such a way uh, that you can at least block it once, if not double block it. Um, the ILM uh, has a little paragraph or, or so on each of these particular applications that kind of tells you um, about the provisions that are being made uh, in terms of uh, safety and, and maintenance for um, these uh, sensors and different uh, types of uh, process extractions. Um, so again, can't stress enough, isolate, vent, and, and purge. Okay, those were generally uh, related to sample uh, sample related hazards. The next little section here is related more specifically towards analyzer hazards. So those related to the analyzer itself. Um, primary concerns here are hazardous area locations when you're dealing with combustibles uh, in, in our gases. Um, also electric shock. So again, specific to the analyzer itself, right? They, they generally are powered by at least uh, 120 volts. So there's potential there for uh, a wake-up call. Uh, and then there's always uh, hazards specific to the analysis itself. So different sensors work in different ways. Some are, uh, some of them are heated, for example, uh, at uh, high temperatures. Uh, one of our combustion analyzers that we have in the lab that you'll uh, get to fool around with uh, has what's called a zirconium oxide sensor in it, uh, and it's 600 degrees. Uh, so it can be hot if you're not paying attention and the whole housing gets hot. So um, you have to be aware, uh, of course, again, the process that you're dealing with and then those things that are inherent uh, to the analyzers that you're working with. So if you're not sure, again, ask questions or, or check the manuals. Okay, moving into some uh, more specific uh, Topics here now, to getting into relative humidity for objective three here, we're going to describe uh, the principles and analysis uh, of a relative humidity analyzer. Uh, we'll define what relative humidity is as well as a bunch of other fancy words. Uh, and we'll talk about some applications uh, of relative humidity analyzers. So here's some general terms. Um, these are, this is a handy little page because I don't think these all come out on one page in the ILM. Um, but these are some of the things that we're going to be talking about throughout the duration of this lecture for sure. So water vapor, uh, most of the stuff I think is uh, relatively uh, straightforward. Um, some of these things are, are new and uh, important to understand. So water vapor uh, is water, of course, that is not a liquid or a solid. It is uh, in its gaseous state uh, and it will vary with the amount of water present and the temperature. So like a boiling pot of water or a pot of water. Uh, you put a liter of water in a pot and you put it on the counter and you're not going to have too much vapor, but you turn on the burner and you increase the temperature and of course the vapor is going to increase. If we were to close that pot, uh, cover it, fasten it down some, somehow uh, and leave it on the stove without any burners on, uh, we're not going to have much pressure inside that pot, but if we uh, and temperature again, uh, the water is going to start to vaporize and it's going to increase pressure uh, inside that pot. And we use the classic example of the jerry can because most of us have experienced that jerry can effect where uh, in the morning your jerry can is all uh, collapsed and, and sucked in. 
because um, the temperature has cooled off overnight and then by mid-afternoon uh, the jerry can is all swollen and bulged, uh, bulged up and that's a direct example of uh, vapor pressure and the associated uh, relationship with temperature. A uh, third term here is called saturated value uh, and the specific to relative humidity, uh, which is the amount of water that air can hold at a given temperature. And one of the points that we drive home through this ILM is the effect uh, of temperature on how much water air can hold. And to put it in, in relatively simple and understandable terms, um, I always try to make kind of a, a relationship between how do you how do you feel, how does your body react to uh, the air in winter, to how does your body react to the air in the, in the summertime? Um, when do we get chapped lips, for example, is, a, is a, a good way to remember this. You know, you don't generally get chapped lips in summertime. I uh, usually get chapped lips in, in wintertime because it's generally drier in winter when it's cold and it's generally um, moister. Uh, I'm, more moisture, I feel like Trudeau here, uh, in, in the summertime when the temperature is higher. So pay attention to what I just said there. Uh, and, and as you read through some of this stuff, you'll be able to apply that. Uh, term four here, relative humidity, the subject in question today uh, is the amount of water in the air compared to what it could hold at the same temperature. And there's a bunch of uh, reading that relates to, to this, of course, because that is a, the topic that we're looking at. And then finally, hygrometers. Uh, which are the tools that we uh, use to measure relative humidity. Okay, so look at all the words here. Uh, relative humidity is all about the amount of moisture in the air, um, at least in the context of this ILM. Um, for us, the concern really is water and instrument air. Uh, it's really the main application that we see as instrument mechanics, um, but there are, of course, other applications that we'll talk about uh, as well. Um, but at different temperatures, as I said earlier, water can hold more or less water. Uh, when, it has, when it has all it can hold, uh, we call that saturated. Uh, and there was a term that we had here that said saturated value. Um, and in nature, if the air is saturated, it usually means that it's about to rain. Now, uh, there's also a relationship with pressure, um, which we kind of delve into, but it's it's not the be all end all. The, um, we will talk about it, um, but it's more of a temperature thing in this ILM. Um, at a higher temperature, there is more pressure created by vaporization. That's kind of the relationship. And you'll see that as the temperature drop, generally rel relative humidity will increase. Um, this means that if air is traveling from inside a, a warmer building to outside, it's going to change uh, and it could condense and freeze. And that's usually one of our biggest concerns as instrument mechanics. Uh, and that is with uh, the drying of our of our instrument air. Um, but there are other applications uh, listed off in the ILM. Uh, these include uh, weather monitoring, which is probably what we most often think about when we're talking about relative humidity. Um, HVAC uh, is um, probably one of the more common applications where uh, a lot of the math that you're going to see here today uh, is related to. Uh, and then, of course, the one that's more of a focus for us as industrial uh, instrument guys uh, is the relationship that um, it has with uh, drying equipment. Um, and that's not just air. Uh, things like wood, for example, in a sawmill where moisture is an important measurement, um, this comes into play. Okay, uh, measurement. So we said earlier, uh, we use hygrometers. Uh, these are the tools that we use for measuring relative humidity. We're going to look at a few different types. Uh, the hair hygrometer, which is very primitive, uh, resistance and capacitive, which are both uh, electrical uh, property-based uh, hygrometers. And the fourth one, which is called a wet dry bulb method. And there's a few different, uh, few different configurations uh, of this. And we'll look at uh, we'll look at all of them. Um, the first three um, have a tie to something called hydroscopic materials, um, and this is a term I just want to get out 
uh, I, I maybe I should have had this on the first page back there. Maybe I'll cut it out when this is over. But a hygroscopic material is one that absorbs moisture or desorbs moisture from the sample flow. Or I sometimes say that it has an affinity for moisture. So if there's moisture around, it's going to collect it. Uh, and the hair uh, and the resistive and the capacitance uh, rely on uh, being able to capture uh, the air, uh, the moisture that's in uh, the air and the wet dry mold is quite a bit different. We'll look at them all. Okay, so the first one here is the, called the fiber method of hygrometer, and it's uh, it's really kind of primitive. Uh, and it started out. We used to call them hair hygrometers back in the day because they uh, they actually did use uh, hair um, for for the link in here. And we'll just quickly discuss how these work here. So hair hygrometers. I've uh, got nothing going on here. These work on the principle that when a hair, or in this modern day, uh, a nylon fiber uh, strand uh, absorbs moisture from the air, they expand. Uh, and this is easy to easy to visualize. Um, if you have someone in your family uh, that has curly hair, for example, they get out of the they get out of the water, and their hair is wet and it's long and it's straight. And as it dries up. Uh, the moisture dissipates and the hair shrinks and that's what causes curly hair and that's one of my stories um, but that's principle of operation for a hair hygrometer relatively straightforward you can see we got uh, human hairs or nylon fibers uh, in this case here and when they're long uh, the link gets longer and allows the pen to move and as they dry out they, the pen moves the opposite direction so relatively primitive but still uh still in place today um the pointer uh, mechanically attached here through some kind of a link link and lever system and this is kind of what it looks like uh in real life um usually if i'm in class i stop now and i tell a story about how i went to montreal uh, about five or six years ago on a work trip uh, and uh, we did a little side venture to a museum and in one of the one of the rooms in the museum, on top of the on top of the shelf, there was an old wooden uh, old wooden machine that had a, a chart on it like this. It didn't look anything like this. It was made out of oak, uh, and it was actually a hair hygrometer from like the 1800s. Uh, and they were still using it to measure the, the moisture content in the room uh, in that museum. So it was pretty interesting to see that. So just another application, I guess, kind of environmental. Here's uh, one of two electronic style uh, relative humidity uh, measuring devices. This is called a resistive hygrometer. Uh, the principle of operation of this is relatively uh, straightforward. If you've got an electrical background and even your first year instrument electronics uh, would hopefully help you understand this. Uh, principle of operation here, a hygroscopic material uh, and mentioned in the ILM here is an acid coated polystyrene uh, attracts water. Uh, as the relative humidity in the air increases, uh, the, that material, of course, will absorb more water. As it absorbs more water, it becomes more conductive, which also means that the resistance goes down. Uh, it then uses a Wheatstone bridge uh, to compare the resistance uh, between uh, the two uh, foils here, I guess. I'm, I'm going to say foils, but we'll call them uh, I don't know, we'll call them wires or foils. Oh yeah, foils. Um, this area here gets water in it, of course, and acts more like a wire and less like an insulator. And we can measure the resistance uh, between the two, the two sides here with uh, a Wheatstone bridge. Uh, these devices will also have usually uh, an RTD so that they can sense the actual temperature uh, at the same time. Okay, capacitance hygrometer, a little bit different in science but uh, not that different here uh, a bunch of words here the principal operation here is basically based upon a change in the capacitance as a polymer film similar to the resistance uh, sensor uh, absorbs and desorbs water vapor and in this case instead of the resistance changing the dielectric constant changes remember air um, has a dielectric constant of one ideally water is much much higher so uh, that range will be between uh, between there somewhere. Uh, this measurement is very small. So again, relatively uh, comparable to the resistance, uh, except of course we're, we're measuring dielectric here and capacitance. 
So let's see here, uh, some interesting points, both capacitive sensors here, they are subject to contamination, drifting, and aging effects, but they are suitable for many applications. Uh, they are robust uh, and uh, against things like condensation and tempor uh, temporary high temperatures. And I think there's some numbers in the ILM uh, associated to that. I think they say 5,000 PSIs or something like that. Um, some points to remember, capacitance for pro is proportional to the dielectric constant, uh, also proportional to the amount of water vapor in the air, uh, and uh, the capacitance is also proportional to the percentage of relative humidity in the air. So uh, math-wise, very, very similar to uh, resistance. Uh, how it works, also very similar to resistance. Basically, it comes down to one of them works on uh, resistive uh, measured variables, and this one works on capacitive uh, measured variables and um, dielectric. What else? I think there's an, oh, there's not another page in here. I thought there would be one more page. Uh, what else do I have to add to this? One thing I'm going to add to this is these capacitance hygrometers are actually quite common. Um, and they are, I'm like, I should almost, I'm going to turn to this page really quick here because I don't want to quote it wrong, but I think they're good for about 5,000 pounds, which doesn't mean, and I'm, this is a life experience of a guy I know. <laughs> Um, if you pressurize them too fast or you depressurize them too fast, uh, you can damage them. So that's just something to uh, kind of remember. Okay, wet dry bulb methods. Uh, try not to laugh at this. Uh, these are relatively primitive, but uh, they are very, um, very uh, useful and uh, consistent. Okay. Um, these are used for measuring the moisture content in the environmental air or humidity. Actually, it's just a tool that gives us some numbers. And from the numbers, we can get all kinds of information. Uh, so this is uh, bulk, uh, I think it's the bulk of the, uh, the section is, is uh, wet dry bulb methods and the math, uh, not really math even, uh, the application of measurements that we get by using the wet dry bulb methods. So, Let's talk about it. What is it? Consists of two thermometers or some other type of temperature measuring device, an RTD, a thermocouple, but uh, for our purposes, uh, describing it in terms of thermometers is probably the easiest. Uh, one which is dry and one which is kept moist, uh, hence the wet dry uh, thing here. Um, and the way they do that is it's just uh, usually a little uh, sock that they just keep wet with, uh, with water. Okay, and, and the way it works here is uh, they extract heat from the material it contacts, and normally uh, when we're using these, we're dealing with air, and one of them will cool faster than the other. Um, think of being at the beach on a cool day, uh, you're cooler when you're wet than you are when dry at the same temperature, right? You're sitting on the, you're sitting on the beach and you're having a drink and it's all nice and you're, you're hot, so you gotta go for a swim. You go for a swim and then you come out and like, holy moly, it's cool out here. Uh, the temperature hasn't changed, but because you're you're wet and you're evaporating, uh, you're getting what's called latent heat of evaporation, which makes you feel cool. Uh, that's the principle of operation uh, for a wet dry bulb type machine. And we'll look at uh, some different ones here. Uh, da, da, da. So here's three different ones. Um, this one here, the battery fan psychrometer, uh, along with the manual sling psychrometer, these images are exactly what we have in the lab uh, and in the lab that we will be doing uh, for relative humidity and dew point measurements. And then the last one here is kind of a process application one where it's mounted uh, in a pipe. Uh, similarities between the two of them, of course, they both have two measuring uh, temperature measuring devices here, so a dry bulb and a wet bulb. Uh, you can't see it here, but dry bulb, wet bulb, dry bulb, wet bulb. Here you can actually see that sock uh, that we're talking about that we that we wet. Uh, and again, basically what's happening is this one here, you're, you're spinning it around in the air, and as you spin it in the air, the moisture uh, causes this sock uh, to evaporate and cool this thermometer faster than this one. This one uses a fan uh, to do the same thing. And this one here uh, moves, uh, actually moves the sample past the thermometers rather than the thermometer through the sample. So um, all 
relatively simple. Okay, in order to get a humidity reading with this device, we uh, whirl it through the air, as I said, and the, uh, some specifics to whirling it, and it's Happy New Year's kind of thing here. The velocity of the air should be at least three meters per second. Uh, don't ask me how you calculate that, um, but you just wing it around in the air like you're partying like it's 1999. Uh, when the readings are steady, you quickly read them before they have a chance to, uh, chance to change. And then we use the numbers that we get from the wet bulb and the dry bulb temperatures, as you see here, uh, and we apply them to something called a psychometric chart. And here's a medium, uh, medium difficulty psychometric chart. Uh, there's other ones that are far more complicated, and there's other ones uh, that we'll see in the ILM that are far more simple. Um, but this is the tool that we use in conjunction with the wet dry bulbs in order to find out all kinds of information. Uh, about the environment. Okay, so here the amount of evaporation and the consequent cooling of the thermometer or RTD depends on the humidity of the atmosphere. Uh, the drier the atmosphere is, uh, the faster this sock is going to evaporate, and the wetter the atmosphere is, the slower this is going to evaporate. So uh, a hot tip here is, uh, the higher the relative humidity, the less temperature difference you're going to have. The lower the relative humidity, the greater temperature difference that you're going to have. Okay, so the water on the wet sock turns from a liquid to a vapor. And again, I said this is called the latent heat of vaporization. Okay, here's a comparison chart between the devices that we've looked at uh, so far. And again, uh, Resistive and capacitive are probably the ones that you're going to be dealing with, with mostly, mostly probably capacitive in the industrial uh, area, the electronic versions. Uh, wet dry bulb is more of an environmental thing, uh, and fiber is more of a, an environmental thing in closed quarters. But here they're all nice and handy in, the, in a little chart uh, here for comparison. Uh, this is probably a major differentiator here. Uh, handheld versions are available. And when you come into the uh, institution for lab week, uh, I'll have examples of uh, most of these devices. Okay, quick summary. Accurate measurements of water content can save thousands of dollars. In natural gas transmission operation, uh, in terms of pipeline, uh, pipeline corrosion and pumping costs. I haven't mentioned pumping costs yet, uh, but this again relates to what's in the pipeline compared to what should be in the pipeline. Uh, if it's a gas, it's really easy to pump and it's cheap to pump. Uh, but if there's water mixed in with that gas, it has a proportional effect on the efficiency of pumping. So it makes pumping costs go up because it's more expensive to pump denser materials. Uh, it's a stretch, I know, but it is a it is a fact. Um, custody transfer quality assurance again uh, important to know uh, what you're sending down pipelines. St <clears throat> excuse me, storage recovery costs. Uh, this is again um, associated to pumping costs, bringing it from battery to battery. <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, and this brings us to objective four, so how to use the psychometric chart and some tables. Um, I'm going to tell you right now that the next section here, as you read through it, can be uh, kind of confusing. Um, the process itself is relatively simple. We are not concerned with all of the information that is provided to you in the ILM. Um, well, we are to a degree, but we are more concerned, I guess, about um, specific ones. And in this ILM, it is uh, wet drop by, uh, dry bulb, relative humidity, uh, and dew point, because that is the focus of the study in this ILM. So start up with some definitions here, uh, just to get us going here. Uh, some of them we've covered already. Dry bulb temperature, uh, usually referred to as the air temperature, because it's doesn't have any evaporative effect as we're as we're using it, so it's usually the same as ambient temperature. Uh, wet bulb temperature uh, is associated with the moisture content of the air, and it's usually different than the ambient temperature. Uh, relative humidity, again, um, 
we've hit this one already, but here's a longer, more impressive definition, uh, is the ratio of water vapor pressure to the vapor pressure of saturated air at the same temperature expressed as a percentage. Otherwise, you could say the moisture holding capacity of air uh, at a given temperature. Uh, and again, I, I've said this earlier, the moisture holding capacity of air increases with temperature. That's why we feel drier in the winter and not as dry in the summer. Moisture content and humidity ratio. Uh, this is a column on uh, one of the psychometric charts. This has to do um, with the amount of uh, water vapor by weight in dry air and not really one of our major concerns in this ILM, but it is uh, something to define. Dew point temperature, uh, this is one of the major points of this ILM. Uh, it is the temperature at which water starts to condense in the air, and that's bad. Uh, it is the temperature at which air becomes completely saturated. Uh, and for us, uh, this is one of the biggies um, because we don't want water coming out of instrument air when that air is contained in an instrument air supply system that provides uh, air to control valves and things like that because they stop working and they could be in a good position and or a bad position. And I have seen this and I saw it in a bad position and it wasn't good. All right, here's the psychometric chart. And these are uh, based on a specific temperature, generally uh, one atmosphere or 101. 0.325, and you'll see there's all kinds of different lines uh, going on here. Uh, pay attention to the lines, the directions of the lines, and the colors uh, of the lines. Uh, in my example here, uh, the ILM is all black and white, and that's fine and well, um, but I think this helps us understand a little bit better uh, when we have the color version here. So let's see what we get going on. Why are all my words disappearing? I don't want them to disappear. Oops, okay, so here we go. Dry bulb temperature, wet bulb temperature, relative humidity, humidity ratio, dew point, and enthalpy. So these are all things that we can find off of this chart. And I've got the colors lined up with the, with the uh, lines here. So wet bulb temperature is blue. That's these diagonal blue lines going across the scale here. Okay, this is an important line for us because we are basing all the information that we're getting from this table off of the wet bulb temperature and the dry bulb temperature. Okay, so diagonal lines like this, wet bulb temperature, so zero degrees, five degrees, six degrees, seven degrees, eight degrees, nine degrees, 10 degrees, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and so on, all the way up to the top. Dry bulb temperature, uh, green lines, these are uh, the vertical, uh, the vertical lines here, so 0 degrees, 5 degrees, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, etc. Across the bottom here, uh, vertical lines, not diagonal, vertical. And I couldn't get this word to turn that way, so sorry about that. Uh, those are the two main ones here. Uh, from that, uh, we can get the relative humidity. So these curved lines here, you'll see starting at 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, all the way to 100%. Those are our relative uh, humidity lines. Uh, next line is our dew point line, which is, oh no, I don't have it on here, which is uh, a horizontal uh, horizontal line, but used on the, on the same scale as the wet bulb temperature. The humidity ratio is this horizontal line that runs across to the scale on this side of the table. And the enthalpy is this diagonal line that you see going across here. So again, the main ones we're concerned with here are wet bulb temperature, dry bulb temperature, relative humidity, uh, and dew point. And it'll be a little bit easier when I show you a simpler chart. Um, but I just, I like to start out with this one because uh, it gives you a good uh, separation between them. Okay, so here's the idea behind this again with at least uh, two known properties and for our applications here, the wet and dry bulb temperatures, it is possible to characterize the air at the intersection of the property lines. This is known as the state point. So a little bit of a confusing read there, but basically what this is saying, if we know the wet bulb temperature and the dry bulb temperature, we can find them on 
the respective scale. We draw a line up. So here's the dry bulb temperature. We're going to say 25 degrees. We find the scale. We know that dry bulb is the uh, vertical lines that go across the scale here. We draw a line and you, you just draw a line straight up. Okay, and then we know the wet bulb temperature. We've measured it from the other thermometer. It's 20 degrees. We go on a scale. I'm sorry it doesn't show it here, but we go on the temperature scale that runs diagonally here. We find our number and then we draw a diagonal line all the way across. Where these two lines intersect, this is called our state point. This is key. Everything that we do is based off of this state point. Okay, from this state point, we can figure out anything else that this chart can provide us. So what is shown here on this graph is how we can determine the relative humidity. The relative humidity is these curved lines on the chart here, and they end up at 100% here and start out at zero way down at the bottom. So where this line goes, there'd be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. This curve here is at 64% where our dot is. So we can say that the relative humidity given this wet bulb and this dry bulb temperature is 64% relative humidity. Very simple. To get the dew point, uh, just about as simple, we will come and we'll draw a horizontal line from that point till we hit this scale, the same scale that we use for the wet bulb. We'll get a number and that'll be our dew point. And those are the major uh, measurements that we're worried about in this ILM. So although it looks rather confusing, it's, it's really not that bad. There are sections in here that will confuse you, but uh, at a 95% of our understanding is dealing with that little bit right there. Okay, so using the chart, uh, handy dandy one page thing that I threw in here. So all you need to know on one page, first you find the state point, again, based off of our temperature. So wet bulb temperature, dry bulb temperature. Where is it in relation to the curved line? That tells us the relative humidity. So we draw our 25 line vertically. We draw our wet bulb temperature diagonally according to the chart. And where that point lands is two things. It's our state point, and it is also our relative humidity in relationship to these curved lines. So in this case, 63.5. Then we draw a horizontal line through that state point, and that'll tell us two more pieces of data. The first one, and again, a big one, is the dew point temperature. And again, using the same scale here, it is 17.6 degrees. And you go the other direction here and you get humidity ratio off a scale uh, that will be provided on the chart um, over here. So that's how the chart is used. Um, the, the words can be confusing, um, but the actual process is, is not so bad. Okay, uh, the next few pages in the ILM uh, are the confusing wordy pages, um, basically describing this process in a longer and more, uh, more detailed way. Uh, and then a few pages after that, we talk about, or somebody talks about the heating and cooling effects on humidity parameters. Um, and we kind of phrase it up, or I'm gonna paraphrase it uh, here. Uh, long story short, Generally speaking, an increase in air temperature will lower the relative humidity and increases its capacity for water vapor before it saturates. And it, it is all explained very well uh, in pages 30 to 34. Um, I didn't include it here because basically it's mathematical proof uh, of the effect of temperature um, on relative humidity. So. Um, it's it's important to understand, but really it basically boils down to uh, to this statement here. Okay, objective five, moving to a new device here, um, dew point analyzers. And our main focus uh, here in dew point analyzers is moisture and instrument air. Um, dew point, uh, again, is the temperature at which moisture will drop out of the air or condense. Main reason we're concerned about it is, of course, we do not water, want water in our air supply line as it would condense and freeze at cold temperatures. The ISA uh, dictates that the dew point for instrument air should be 7.8 degrees lower than the coldest expected ambient temperature at line pressure. Uh, in practice, 
we aimed for 10 degrees. Um, I noticed yesterday as I refreshed myself in a new version of the ILM that this section has been taken out, um, which kind of boggles my mind um, because this is probably the most important thing to, to know about dew point. Uh, and you're going to want to know this because I am not taking this out. Uh, I am not taking it out of any quizzes or tests um, because it's very, very critical that we understand uh, the moisture content of our instrument air because when there are failures, um, they are bad. <clears throat> okay, dew point. Uh, also important in the transport of hydrocarbon gases like natural gas. And we alluded to that when we were talking about relative humidity too. And there is a little bit of a relationship, uh, of course, between these two properties. Okay, uh, measurement methods. Uh, this is kind of handy here. Most of the same devices that measure uh, relative humidity are used to measure dew point, uh, such as resist resistive and capacitive sensors. Uh, they respond the same way to the amount of water in the air. Um, as water vapor increases, uh, the resistance uh, decreases and capacitance increases, as we discovered when we were talking about relative humidity measurement. <clears throat> Dew point increases as the amount of water vapor in the air increases. And then this is a handy dandy little uh, image here. So as pressure goes up, dew point goes up and resistance goes down, meaning we have more water, so uh, more conductivity, less, less resistance. Uh, as, different, uh, as dew point goes up, capacitance also goes up. So same, same as it was uh, for relative humidity. Okay, look at some of the uh, specific devices here to measure uh, dew point here, the hygrometers. So the first one here is uh, impedance hygrometer. Uh, and again, there's a lot more words in the ILM than I've, just, than I've decided to include in this presentation. Um, but some things I want to point out from the ILM that I haven't included uh, here. Uh, this little thing on the end of this hygrometer, this is called a, a sintered steel filter, uh, also uh, called a flame arrester. You may or may not have seen these in the field already, but this is a common, uh, common device. And a basic application here is that it allows to, a gas to go through there, but it does not allow uh, the mixing of gas and oxygen uh, within it. So there's no way for a flame to propagate uh, from, you know, a spark perhaps uh, manufactured or created in here by accident. To, to propagate as a flame through here and get into a, a potentially uh, flammable process. Um, and it's made out of teeny little steel balls that are pressed together into a, into a shape. And I know it's mentioned in the ILM, but I didn't write anything about it. So I just thought I'd make a quick little blurb there on that. <clears throat> okay, uh, probe cross section here uh, kind of looks like this here, uh, the probes. Uh, an aluminum strip with a porous layer of aluminum oxide that insulates between uh, the two elements here. Uh, it has a thin coat of gold uh, which covers the aluminum oxide. Um, this specific device is the one that I was thinking about when I was telling you not to pressure it up too fast or uh, depressurize it too fast uh, because what happens when you do that, it blows, it blows the thin coat of gold off of the sensor and breaks the sensor in there. 800 bucks and I know this because a, a friend of a friend of a guy that I knew uh, did that once at work. Okay, uh, there's a little picture there, the outer gold electrode, aluminum base and the oxide insulator. And then again, this oxide insulator has a propensity for uh, absorbing uh, or desorbing moisture that's in the air. And it's connected to when that happens um, and then of course we get an electrical measurement that comes from that uh, these are the ones that work up to 5,000 psi okay uh, what do we got here the number of water molecules attaching to the aluminum oxide is a function of the water vapor pressure in the sample each molecule absorbs contributes a distinct increment to the total conductivity of the aluminum oxide so uh, principles of operation wise, nothing new here that we haven't really looked at earlier. Okay, this 
Uh, next one is a little bit different here. It's called the chilled surface style or the chilled mirror method. Uh, this one is automatic. Uh, I believe the next slide will have a version of this that is manual. Um, here's how it works. Let's just have a quick zoom zoom here and get some words up. Okay, um, we have sample coming in, we have sample coming out, we have a light source, we have a light detector, we have an RTD, we have a solid state cooler. Uh, this is like the, um, I don't know if you have one of those uh, 12 volt plug-in camping coolers or you know the, the beer coolers you can plug into your car to keep your, uh, your bevies cold. Um, this is what that is. And so the idea here is this electrical uh, cooler chills this mirror, the gas comes across it. Um, if it condenses on the mirror, of course, this light's not going to reflect as well. Um, it's going to get detected. Um, when it gets detected, the temperature is measured, and lo and behold, it tells us um, what our dew point temperature is. So, uh, long story short, so that's basically the way that one there works. Um, Next one here, oh, Peltier effect. That's the, that's the electronic fancy word for uh, this solid state cooler. It works on the Peltier effect if you, if you care. It's not part of the ILM. But I think it's cool. That's why I include it. Okay, next up is the manual version of this. Um, this is also called the Alnor Dew Point or Bureau of Mines method. Uh, cooling the air point of concentration. Uh, will produce the dew point. So this does basically the exact same thing as the previous device did, um, only it's a manual version here. Uh, compressed gas is released. This cools the sample because of expansion uh, and a decrease in gas pressure. It's just like when you use an aerosol can, it's under pressure inside the aerosol can and the can feels room temperature. You press the aerosol nozzle, you let the aerosol out, and after a little bit of time here, the, the can gets cold. That's due to the, the vaporization of the gas and all that kind of good stuff. And it uses that principle. Okay, that fog then is produced when the sample condenses and the air temperature is measured on a thermometer or a thermocouple here we see. And the dew point temperature is measured there. So very nice, uh, very nice manual version of the old device there. Okay, gas transport applications. Again, this is kind of specific to pipelining. Um, big red words here. Dew point is not temperature dependent, but it is pressure dependent. Um, and when we're talking about pipeline applications, there's specific things that we want to be aware of. When gas is transported, it is important, of course, there's no water vapor in the lines. Uh, in Alberta particularly, they're running cold climates and if that vapor uh, reaches its dew point, it will condense and cause uh, rust and ice uh, in the lines. Uh, and even worse, water is in the instrumentation which could freeze and damage it uh, and or causing you know, uh, pressure sensors not to detect pressure or flow sensors not to detect flow. All kinds of bad things uh, can happen. Dew point temperature increases as pressure increases and there's a bunch of math in the ILM that proves this um, and this means that, that as the pipeline pressure goes up the freezing temperature is higher or warmer uh, and this is I find this hard to keep straight in my head um, but this is a fact that's important to know and when we're talking about pipelines specifically uh, we talk about something called the pressure dew point and this is the pressure uh, of the pipeline or the line pressure of the pipeline at which we measure uh, the dew point. So it's a little bit of uh, specific stuff related to pipelining. Okay, again, uh, impedance sensors, which we mentioned earlier, are good for up to 5,000 PSI, are one of the more common devices uh, used for pipeline uh, dew point measurements. All right, um, so when we're not in a pipeline, we could be uh, at atmospheric pressure. Um, and of course, um, we have to be able to convert between uh, these different pressures. Uh, if we extract a sample, for example, from a pressurized pipeline into atmospheric pressure, uh, it's going to change it. Uh, density changes with pressure, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to have a table or chart in order to convert dew point temperature to line pressure values. 
Remember, the dew point temperature must be at least 10 degrees colder than the coldest expected ambient temperature. Um, the next couple of slides here, or the next slide, deals with this conversion uh, between uh, pressures and the relationship between dew point. Um, I don't get into it too deeply here. It's, it becomes fairly obvious, I think, as you read your way through it here. Um, but the example in the ILM says here, we measure a dew point of minus 50 uh, on instrument air at 400 PSI. Find the dew point at atmospheric pressure. So let's find uh, uh, minus 50 on the pressure scale on the right here. So minus 50, we go across here uh, to hit the 400 PSI line, and it tells us our, our dew point is at like minus 75 degrees. Did I, did I do that right there? And then if we do it at 100, uh, 100 PSI, you see that we get uh, a difference. So we'll notice that as the pressure went up, the freezing temperature was lower. So that's how you read those charts. Um, I probably did a really bad job describing that, but it's, uh, it's described very well in the ILM. So that takes us through the first part of um, gas analyzers. Um, coming up in the next one, I can't remember what our topics are in the second ILM if we get into combustion right away. A uh, little bit more on moisture analyzers coming up as well as some solid moisture analyzers. And then we start getting into combustion, which is more or less the third ILM in its entirety. So that is the end uh, of today's presentation. I hope you enjoyed yourself. See you next time.